Three Shall Meet by Frederick Kells. On a dismal December afternoon in the year 1765, a lone horseman rode across Boulderstone Moor in the gathering dusk. A light sprinkling of snow clung to the stunted thorns and almost obliterated the narrow track. The rider was evidently familiar with the district, for there was no hesitation about his progress as he left the path and climbed a gentle rise. When he gained the summit, the main road stretched before him, and he drew rain where a gibbet, with its burden of chains and bones, creaked in the wind. He hardly glanced at the gallows, but looked ahead to where, in the sheltered valley, the lights of a village gleamed through the mist. With a sigh of satisfaction, he spurred his horse onwards and did not stop again until he had rattled down a cobbled street and the sign of the bells of Boulderstone swung above his head. At the inn door, he alighted, fastened his horse to a hook by the porch and entered the hostelry. John Skinner, the landlord, hasting forward to welcome the guests, stopped in agitated surprise with his eyes goggling. God bless my soul, he exclaimed. If it isn't Master William, whatever brings you back to Boulderstone, sir? You may well ask that, my worthy John, was the cheery response. Return of the prodigal, I suppose. The best welcome you can offer is a pint of your mulled claret, and I'm more than ready for it. It's plaguy cold outside, or else I grow soft with easy living. Make it two pints, my friend, and you shall keep me company and tell me all the news. The host, still mumbling expressions of polite surprise, flung open the door of a small parlour and bowed the stranger to a seat by the blazing fire. Then, with a word of excuse, he hurried away to fetch the drink. Left to himself, William Maskell cast his hat and cloak aside and settled down in the saddlebag chair. He chose a pipe from the rack near to his hand, helped himself from the tobacco jar and stretched his legs before the crackling logs. He was puffing away contentedly when Skinner returned with the steaming wine. "'Good for you, John,' the traveller cried. "'This tobacco is much better than any I can get in London, "'and I'm sure the claret is as good as any ever shipped out of France "'and landed under cover of darkness in Twiston Cove. "'I'll wager King George never had the penny duty on either, "'and that makes them all the sweeter.' "'The landlord gave a wheezy laugh. "'You haven't changed a bit, Master William. "'You always did like your little bit of fun.' Draw up, John, and we'll pledge one another whilst you tell me what is going on up at the Grange. A shadow crossed the landlord's jovial face, but he gratefully lowered his fat body into the seat on the opposite side of the hearth. Alas, Master William, he said with some hesitation, there's nothing good I can say about your brother. My half-brother, you mean, corrected his guest. God forbid that the kinship should be any closer than need be. I doubt if anyone could say anything good of him. He always was the most hated man in the county, and I'm certain that time hasn't mellowed him. Heaven alone knows what he wants with me. It's ten years since I left the ancestral home, and I never thought to cross his threshold again. Did Sir Ambrose send for you, Master William? Aye, that he did. A message of honeyed words has brought me from the city, and I already misdoubt me of its sweetness. My dear half-brother wrote that he was weakened by sickness and there were things that must be settled before he could die in peace. Reconciliation is a noble thing, so we are told by the preachers. But knowing Ambrose, I am sure he will want something in return for a rather withered olive branch. The old landlord's voice quavered a little as he replied, He is an evil man to cross and not one to forgive an injury. There do be many who say he's quite mad since you ran off with the Lady Madeline. Pardon me for mentioning the matter, Master William. William Maskell was silent for a few moments, and when he answered, the laughter was gone out of his voice. There's no reason why you shouldn't speak of it, John. Madeline has been dead these seven years, but we had three years of great happiness together. I bet that when we went away together, that little bit of gossip lasted the village twelve months or more, and even then the good people never got the rights of it. Tales were told, admitted his host, but everyone in the village was on your side, Master William. 
Some said that Sir Ambrose wanted the lady for himself. That was quite true, he did, but can you or any sensible person imagine Lady Madeline accepting Ambrose as a suitor for her hand? Fortunately, she showed herself a woman of taste, albeit lacking in ambition, when she honoured me with her trust and affection. It was perhaps a little unfortunate that we were forced to leave the ground rather hurriedly, and that my parting gift to my half-brother was a blow between the eyes, but these things do happen, my worthy friend even in the best regulated families, and ours was never well regulated. Ambrose, I regret to say, was always a nasty piece of work. I presume he is still as parsimonious as ever, and does little entertaining at the Grange. Entertaining, echoed John Skinner with contempt in his voice. Never a friendly foot has entered that house since you went away. Old Janet, the housekeeper, died six years ago, come Candlemas. And since then, Sir Ambrose has lived there alone with only that dumb fellow, Simon Drew, to look after him. As I have often said to my good lady, the house must be a ripe pigsty, and as full of rats as a ripe stilton is full of mites. It was always a rat-infested warren, was the laughing rejoinder. I can tell you that I don't relish having to spend even one night there, and you may yet see me back to climb a warm bed in your best chamber. Draining his glass, he jumped to his feet and flung his cloak around his shoulders. No, I must be going, I promise you that, if the hospitality of the Grange is not all I consider it should be. I should be knocking at your door before midnight. The landlord accompanied his guest to the door with loud assurances that the resources of the bells were his for the asking. As Maskell mounted his horse, John Skinner laid a hand upon his arm and whispered, Be careful, Master William. Yon half-brother of thine is a man who does not forget a grudge, and I mistrust his invitation. William Maskell doubled his fist in a significant gesture, and with a smile on his lips, rode into the night. Boulderstone Grange looked strangely forbidding in the light of the moon. The moat which encircled the ancient building gleamed with a sinister phosphorescence, and its dank stench hung on the frosty air. William rode across the stone bridge, and dismounting at the gate, pulled at a rusty chain which set a bell clanging in the distance. Almost immediately slouching footsteps echoed on the cobbles, and the stout door swung on its hinges. The man who came forward with a lantern in his hand was a misshapen dwarf. Making unintelligible noises, he took the horse's bridle and led it through the gate, at the same time motioning the visitor to enter the house by a doorway on the other side of the courtyard. Maskell realised that this humpback creature must be the mute to whom Skinner had referred, and resigning his horse to the servant's charge, he made his way into the mansion. Before him stretched a long corridor from which branched a passage, which he remembered led to the domestic quarters. A feeble lamp illuminated the entrance, but a stronger light came from a half-open door at the end of the corridor. He went towards this, knocked on the panels, and entered a spacious room in which half a dozen candles burned in tarnished silver sconces. A dull log fire flickered feebly in the hearth, and by it sat Sir Ambrose Maskell. In spite of his recumbent attitude, he was obviously a man well beyond normal size. A dark beard streaked with grey partly concealed a cruel mouth, and his hairy hands spread on the arms of the chair, indicating great strength. As his half-brother entered the room, his eyes glittered with triumph, but he made no attempt to rise in welcome. So you have come, William, he said, and his voice was curiously thin and reedy for a man of his size. Yes, I have come, responded the younger man, or now I fail to see what you can want with me after so many years. He removed his hat and cloak and flung them onto a carved chest. You will understand in good time replied the piping voice. I intend, however, that we shall leave business until the morning. 
and devote this evening to such modest conviviality as shall be fitting for our reunion. But for Simon Drew, I live quite alone, and it is long since I had a visitor to cheer me. That is your own fault, said William brusquely. You don't look very sick, and I should not like to think I had been bought here under false pretenses. Don't be deceived by appearances, Sir Ambrose purred. I am sick of an ailment for which there is no cure. I was loath to die, leaving so much unsettled between us. I was hoping that our business could be transacted this evening and then I could return to the inn without inflicting my presence upon you for longer than is necessary, replied the other. The inn, my good fellow, protested Sir Ambrose. It would be a poor reflection upon my hospitality if I allowed my father's son to lodge in the village hostelry when he visits his home for the first time in ten years. Yes, William, it is ten years since we parted in anger. Ten years to this very day, the 10th of December. Why, so it is, agreed his half-brother with a start of surprise. I am not so observant of anniversaries as you appear to be. Sir Ambrose chuckled softly, but there was no humour in his laugh. You forget, but I remember. It is fitting that we should be reconciled on the 10th anniversary of our quarrel. See, my head still bears the mark of that blow. Your ring cut into my flesh and the scar remains. He turned his face to the light and showed a thin white mark on his dark brow. I wonder if it was worth it, William. According to all accounts, your time with the lady was very short. We won't talk of Madeline, said William, enough that I had three years of happiness with her as my wife. It would befell her name if it should pass your lips. An uncomfortable situation was saved by the entrance of the servant who proceeded to set the table for a meal. William seated himself near the fire and watched a strange dwarf bring dishes and glasses, plates and cutlery from a large press. Soon the repast was ready and heaving himself from his chair, Sir Ambrose led the way to the table. The fare, although plain, was good and plentiful, and an assortment of bottles on a side table indicated that the squire of Boulderstone intended to offer reasonable entertainment. Hardly a word was exchanged as the meal proceeded and the uncouth servitor attended to their wants. William occasionally glanced at his host and with some uneasiness became aware of the fact that Sir Ambrose was labouring under an excitement which he strove to suppress. When the elder man made some pretense of eating and drinking, it was obvious that he had no appetite and his hands trembled as no if argue. When the meal was over, he rose unceremoniously and led the way back to the fireside. Simon Drew removed the dishes, placed pipes, tobacco and glasses to hand, and left the half-brothers alone. William did not settle immediately. He stood before the fire for a few moments, and then wandered round the room inspecting the portraits on the walls. Pausing before the picture of a dark-visaged man dressed in a costume of the time of the Commonwealth, he remarked, Our great-grandfather was a villainous-looking individual. No wonder the people said he was mad or even worse. They say the same about me, I believe, replied Sir Ambrose, but madness is akin to genius, and Clifford Maskell was a clever man. Isn't he the one who is supposed to have constructed a secret room, the location of which is known only to the head of the family? His half-brother gave him a keen glance beneath his beetling brows. All sorts of tales are told of him, he said. There are some to assert that he sold his soul to the devil and in return gained wealth and honour under the protectorate. The family legend is that, at the end of his days, he was carried off by old Dick. The only certain thing is that his body doesn't rest in the Maskell vault in the Boulderstone Church. William returned to the fire and settled himself in a low chair. I remember when we were boys we used to search for that secret room. 
I suppose, if there is such a place. Our Father revealed it to you, Ambrose, and you know all that he conceals. But perhaps it isn't fair to ask. I seem to recall that the threshold must only be crossed by one person at a time, and he the head of the family. Probably there is no such room, and it was just a tale told to frighten us youngsters. What was the doggerel old Janet used to repeat to us? He puckered his brow in an effort to remember, but before he could speak again, his host supplied the words of the rhyme. When two of masculine blood shall meet, a third who knows no hallowed tomb, beware, beware, for in that hour a knell shall sound the masculine doom, when three of masculine blood keep tryst, and one alone has tongue to speak. This prophecy shall clearer be. Its meaning is not far to seek. His sibilant voice whispered through the room and William shivered involuntarily. He gave an uneasy laugh and said, Not what you'd call a cheerful verse, is it? I'd quite forgotten about it until old Clifford's portrait made me think of the secret room and all the tales that were told of our wicked progenitor. Let us forget it, responded Sir Ambrose. Perhaps you'll favour me with a game of cards. It is a long time since I had a partner and one becomes a trifle bored with patience. He rose, opened the drawer of a bureau and produced dice and a pack of cards. William flung a hatful of guineas on the table and his half-brother, taking a dozen or so coins from his purse, methodically piled them in a tidy heap in front of him. For a couple of hours, the only sounds in the room were the rattle of dice, the swish of cards, and the jingle of money. When the clock struck eleven, William was six guineas to the good and did not protest when Ambrose gathered up the cards and suggested it was time for bed. You will need a good nightcap to keep out the chills of this old house, William, he said, crossing to the side table, and selecting a bottle from those placed there by the serving men. Here is a fine crusty port which I think will please your palate. He filled a goblet and carried it to his guest. I do not drink myself before retiring to rest as I find that wine taken at this hour makes me disinclined for sleep. The younger man accepted the drink and tossed it off. A good wine is the best soporific, he laughed. I'll have another glass before you put the bottle away. The second goblet was quickly emptied and William rose to his feet. Ambrose took two candlesticks from the table, lit the tapers at the fire and, handing one to his half-brother, led the way from the room. The flickering lights cast grotesque shadows as the two men climbed the stairs, and Ambrose ushered William into the great chamber in the west wing. Sleep well, my brother, said the elder as he turned to depart. Sleep very well, and perchance in your dreams you may discover the secrets of the Grange. I never dream, replied William as the door closed. That's the best of having an easy conscience. He divested himself of his clothes, donned the nightshirt which Simon Drew had placed in readiness, and climbed into bed. He felt very tired, and there was an unpleasant bitterness in his mouth. Blaming it upon too many potations, he drew the bedclothes up to his chin and closed his eyes. William Maskell saw his half-brother's face in the dim light of a lantern, and became painfully aware that something strange had happened to him. Although he was fully conscious and could see what was going on around, a curious numbness gripped his limbs and he was incapable of articulating the word. He heard the thin voice of Sir Ambrose purring like a monstrous cat. You cannot move, my dear William. Our ancestor, Sir Clifford, was a clever man, and it was he who compounded a drug which I slipped into your wine. For at least two hours you will remain under its influence, and in that time 
I will reveal to you all the family secrets. You shall meet our great-grandfather and see the hidden room which he constructed. His voice broke into a harsh chuckle. Not that the knowledge will ever do you any good. You are going to die, my dear William. Surely you did not think I had forgotten the debt I had to settle with you. He crossed to the wall and pressed a carved flare on the panelling. With a soft click, a concealed door opened and a draught of cold air blew into the room. Now, whispered Sir Ambrose, I am going to carry you to the secret chamber. You can understand all I say and see all I do, but your limbs and your tongue are paralysed. He bent over William, hoisting the unresistant form upon his back and staggered across the room and through the little door. On the other side, he paused for a moment to close the aperture and then began to descend the winding stone staircase. He frequently stopped to rest and ease himself of the weight, but at last they came to a low vaulted passage. William saw a massive door, a solid slab of stone, which he observed was tied open with a strip of rush rope. Beyond was a dismal chamber with a damp trickling down the walls. The cell was furnished with a heavy table and two stools, upon one of which Ambrose deposited his burden. He placed the lantern upon the table, but its feeble gleam left the greater part of the chamber in deep shadow. Now, said the squire of Boulderstone, we can talk. At least I shall have to do all the talking, for you cannot answer me back. We are now in the secret room, far below the waters of the moat. You will notice that I have fastened the door open. The reason for this is that it can only be unlocked from outside, and if it closed while I am with you, I should be compelled to share your fate. I have told you that our ancestor was clever, but he wasn't clever enough. I think he got caught by his own device. Look, my dear William. Taking the lantern in his hand, he carried it to a corner of the cell, and its light fell upon a mouldering skeleton, to which still clung a few tattered rags. Yes, you are quite right, went on the shrill voice. It is our ancestor, Sir Clifford, and the devil did not fly away with him after all. William's anguished eyes looked to his half-brother in mute appeal, as if struggling to awaken something of pity in that demented mind. It's no use looking at me like that, shrieked the madman. You took the only woman I ever wanted in my life, and although she died so young, you had her youth and beauty. It was your hand that struck me on this very night ten years ago, and I swore then that I would have my revenge. I have plotted and planned for this hour. Death is too easy even the slow death to which you are doomed. The hand that struck me down shall suffer first. With fiendish chuckles, he retired into the shadows and lifting something from the ground, brought it into the light. It was an iron cage containing six large rats. They are hungry, he said, very hungry. I have promised them a nice succulent morsel with warm red blood for gravy. Taking William's right hand, he carefully raised the lid of the cage and then pushed the hand inside. It was a tight fit and effectively blocked the aperture. For a moment, the terrified and starved rodents scampered about and then they began to nibble. The madman with inflamed eyes watched the blood start to trickle through the bars. As the hand became raw and lacerated by the sharp teeth, his hideous laughter filled the vault, and he held the lantern high so that he could better witness his half-brother's silent agony. The hand first, he screamed, later the real feast will begin. After I have closed the door and left you with our great-grandfather, other rats will come out of the walls, and they are all so hungry. They haven't had a good feed since they gnawed Sir Clifford's flesh off his bones. What a pity it is for you, William, 
that a drug which has made your limbs so useless has not rendered you insensible to pain. You will soon faint with agony, and then I shall leave you. When you recover from your swoon, it will be one man against a thousand rats. Neither Ambrose nor the tortured William had noticed a long grey shape, which ever since they had entered the room had been poised on the length of rush rope which held the door wide. Its keen teeth had almost severed the frail fastening, and when it dropped to the floor the cord parted with a snap. Ambrose turned too late. He saw the ponderous stone swinging on its hinges, and with a frantic cry he dashed across to stop it, but in his haste he tripped over a stool, and before he could recover himself the door closed and the secret lock clicked home. With frenzied hands he beat against the rough slab until he was exhausted. His terrified shrieks became more feeble as he realised that his efforts to escape were all in vain. The dying light of the lantern flickered through the gloom and was reflected in a hundred pairs of little eyes as the grey bodies stole out of the crevices in the walls and waited patiently for the darkness.